Welcome to Worship with Centenary United Methodist Church in Morristown, Tennessee. I am Ginger Isom, the pastor. Whether you are a church member, a regular or first time guest with us online, we are delighted to have you worshiping with us. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. God Almighty, El Shaddai, the all-sufficient, all-bountiful one, this morning as we gather for worship, we come knowing that you are gathered with us and long to pour out blessings upon us, blessings we may not yet see, but blessings that you bring to fruition, for you alone are able. Hear us in our places of worship, whether it be in our home, in our places of work. The praises that we bring to you this day, for you are worthy of our praise. Amen. Our Psalter reading is Psalm 91, and you will join me in the response which you will find printed on the screen. Let us join together. Those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For the Lord will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence and will cover you with his pinions. Under the Lord's wings you will find refuge. God's faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your habitation, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For God will give, you, will give his angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up on their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will travel, trample underfoot. Because they cleave to me in love, I will deliver them. I will protect them because they know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. I will satisfy them with long life and show them my salvation. Amen. Let us pray. God Almighty, 
El Shaddai. Just as you met Abraham to speak with him, to bless him. Today you have gathered us wherever we are for that very purpose, to speak blessing upon us. For you are the all-sufficient one, the all-bountiful one, who longs to pour out blessings of love and fullness and joy to your children. Forgive us that we are often unworthy to receive those blessings because we have failed to remember your all-sufficiency. Instead, we have tried to be self-sufficient. I can do that myself. I can take care of this on my own. I don't need anyone. And all too often, we have made you feel that we don't even need you. But El Shaddai, nothing could be further from the truth this day. In every waking moment, we need you. And in truth, there is nothing in this world that we need but you. You are our sufficiency. You are enough for us. You are more than enough for us. Forgive us. Forgive us of failing to remember that each day. And continue to pour out your blessings of love upon us so that we can be a blessing to others in your name around us. Today, El Shaddai, we also ask that you pour out your blessings upon those that are in need today. Those who are sitting beside loved ones who are ill. Those who are ill. Those who are struggling to make ends meet because of unemployment or underemployment. Our children and teachers in schools for their safety and the safety of their families as they return home during this COVID-19 pandemic. Lord, for our country and the division that is so prevalent, we need healing. We need healing. Lord, hear our prayers today for each of these we lift to you now in our hearts. And may they experience a double portion of your blessing in some way. Lord, may we be a part of that blessing as we reach out to those around us that need to feel your presence through a tangible person. Help us to not be afraid to go where you lead us, just as Abraham left everything to go to a place he did not even know. Give us that same courage and trust in you who is our all-sufficient one. Lord, hear these our prayers this day. And now with the confidence of children, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture this morning comes from Genesis 17, 1 through 8. And I'm reading this morning from the New Living Translation. Hear the word of God for this morning. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this, Abram fell face down on the ground. Then God said to him, This is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham for you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations and kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give you the entire land of Canaan, where you now live as a foreigner, to you and your descendants. It will be their possession forever, and I will be their God. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word this morning. Will you pray with me and for me? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever thought you understood something completely only to discover that you were mistaken? It happens to all of us more often than we'd like to admit. Most of the time it happens innocently. We read or we hear something and it makes sense. And so we take it at face value. We don't dig or search for details or look for the background or the origin. We just take it as it is and move on. We see that happening a lot today in what we read and hear in the news on both sides of the aisle regarding issues, po politics, current events, so on and so forth. But it can happen with anything. It's kind of like that old game of gossip that we played as children. Remember that? Someone on one end of a line of people begins passing down a sentence or a phrase to the next person by whispering it in, in their ear. And that person does the same with the one adjacent to them on down the line until it comes to the final person who reveals aloud what they have been told. And generally what we discover is that what the last person hears isn't very close to what the first person said. Yet everyone in between believed what they had been told because they heard it with their own ears. Sometimes words mean something different depending on where you are or how it is used. And your use of that word may not be anything akin to its original meaning. Take for example the word smart. Any dictionary you go to has as part of its definition of the word smart, advanced intelligence or the feeling of pain, like, ooh, that smarts. But when you add the word right to it, such as right smart, it doesn't mean either of those things. And you won't find the meaning of smart in this sense of the word in a standard dictionary. That's because it is a regional use of the word, specifically Southern Appalachia, where right smart refers to quantity, a right smart amount. In my first appointment, I had a woman who used those two words together, those three words together quite often, right smart amount. And I remember that vividly. These misunderstandings or maybe more accurately misinterpretations even happen with scripture. The name we are unpacking today is a case in point, And that name is El Shaddai, 
El Shaddai. What does the name El Shaddai mean? Many scholars point out that to perhaps best understand what El Shaddai means, we must first understand what it does not mean. In our modern translations, like what I read this morning, and even in the, New, the King James Version, the name El Shaddai is often translated as God Almighty or Almighty God. This rendering of El Shaddai as God Almighty evokes certain mental images of someone with tremendous power and strength, one who can overtake an opponent, even one who can be destructive, one who demands awe, and maybe even one who elicits trepidation. Definitions of the word Almighty in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary include unlimited in power, having great power or importance extreme. Yet when we study the origin of the name El Shaddai, we discover that what, what we often have understood it to mean has been misinterpreted. Let's start by looking at the context of the first use of this name in today's passage from Genesis. God comes to Abraham, Abram when he is 99 years old. Previously, God had come to him and asked him, called him to pick up and leave his home everything that he had known to go to a place that he did not know, was not even sure where this place was located, promising him and his wife Sarai that they would produce descendants who would become a great nation and who would inhabit the land that God would give them. Time has passed, the couple has aged, and there have been no descendants. Thus, in the chapter preceding our passage today, we read of Abram and Sarai taking matters into their own hands, resulting in Ishmael being born to Sarai's handmaiden, Hagar, to ensure an heir for Abram. It is to this Abram in his old age, who disappointedly has not received the promise of heirs through Sarai, also in her old age, that El Shaddai comes. And once again, El Shaddai promises Abram that his descendants will be a great nation, and he and his descendants will be given the land of Canaan as their own. Symbolic of this promise is the change of names from Abram to Abraham. Now, while we certainly cannot deny the power of God in this passage, this passage doesn't generate images of the power and strength we mentioned earlier with regards to the word Almighty. There is no hocus pocus abracadabra instant creation of heirs to Abraham. There is no waving wand that when tapped by or magic mirror that when looked into removes 50, 60, 70 years from Abram's and Sarai's bodies, putting them back in childbearing age. No, seemingly nothing has changed. Yet once again, the promise was given. So what does El Shaddai really mean? In his book, Names of God, which I have referenced in our reflection on the name Elohim, author Nathan Stone reminds us that El in and of itself is a name of God, and it is in this name El that the power of God is referred to. Remember, Elohim was the God of creation, the one who spoke, and, and as Elohim spoke, the creation came into being in its various parts. Power, the power that emanated from El, Elohim. He reminds us also that the name El is translated, as he says, over 200 times in the Bible with that understanding, that understanding of power that God as El possesses. He is the God of miracles, the God who displays power and even bestows this power on others. The God who intervenes, intervenes on the behalf of others and so on. The recognition of God's might and power are embedded into that name El. It's embedded into that name El, implied as it is spoken, as it is heard, as it is read. 
So if not power and might, then that leaves us asking, what is the meaning of Shaddai? Stone acknowledges that our interpretation of Shaddai as almighty may be influenced by the Latin Vulgate, a fifth century Latin translation of the Bible usually attributed to Jerome. But the Israel Institute for Biblical Studies says this misinterpretation most likely comes from the close proximity of the word Shaddai with the word Shaddad, which means to destroy or overpower, and in numerous Hebrew lexicons, to deal with violently. As we read this interaction between God and Abraham, we are not hearing God as one who destroys or overpowers or one who is dealing with Abraham violently. That's not the picture that we are given. Instead, we are hearing from God as one who deals with Abram compassionately, one who is giving, I am going to give you descendants, one who offers hope for a couple who has been hopeless with regards to children, one who will make good on his promises. Thus, there is another more likely route for Shaddai, and this one you will find quite surprising and maybe even shocking. The Israel, Israel Institute for Biblical Studies goes on to say, the word shad has a much closer grammatical connection to Shaddai, and it means breast. Moreover, when a word ends with an I or an AI, it almost always means my. It's a possessive. So literally, El Shaddai could very well mean God is my breast. And the Institute continues, if we consider this intriguing imagery as interpretive possibility, we may see this as one of the key symbols of sustenance and parental love passed on from God, the parent, to humanity, God's child. So instead of God Almighty, El Shaddai should probably be translated as God All-Sufficient instead. God All-Sufficient. Parental love passed on from God the parent to humanity, God's child. Wasn't that what we were seeing in this exchange between God and Abraham? An exchange of love. I am going to give you, I am going to bless you. I am going to bring you joy. Stone supports this understanding in his book, as do others such as Andrew Jukes in his work, The Names of God, Discovering God as He Desires to Be Known, who says, should die describes power, but it is the power not of violence, but of all bountifulness. Not of violence, but of all bountifulness. The poorer, the poorer, or shedder forth, that is of blessings, both spiritual and temporal. Stone points out that in the Septuagint, the early, earliest translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, the translators often use the word ikonos for Shaddai, which means all sufficient. And he writes in much the same as Jukes, saying, Thus in this name, God is seen to be the power or shedder forth of blessings the all-sufficient and the all-bountiful one. Of course, the idea of one who is all-powerful and almighty is implied in this, for only an all-powerful one could be all-sufficient and all-bountiful. He is almighty because he is able to carry out his purposes and plans to their fullest and most glorious and triumphant completion. He is able to triumph over every obstacle and over all opposition. That is, he is sufficient for all these things. He is sufficient. He is able to overcome Abram's and Sarai's inability to have children. But the word able applied to God refers more than anything else to what he wants to do, wants to be, and do for humanity. 
So he is able to save to the uttermost. And he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. From all that is felt that the name El Shaddai or God Almighty is much better understood as that El who is all sufficient and all bountiful, the source of all blessing and fullness and fruitfulness. Isn't that more akin to the God we see engaging Abraham in Genesis 17? Here we have Abram and Sarah barren, yet El Shaddai blesses them with fullness and fruitfulness. And we see this same God Almighty El Shaddai in Genesis 28.3 speaking to Jacob. May God Almighty El Shaddai bless you and give you many children. Bless you and give you many children. And may your descendants multiply and become many nations. And again, with speaking blessing upon Jacob, now Israel in Genesis 35, 11, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. You will become a great nation, even many nations. Kings will be among your descendants. And I will give you the land I once gave to Abraham and Isaac. Yes, I will give it to you and your descendants after you. In Genesis 43, 14, as Jacob sends his sons back to Egypt to go before their brother Joseph, who they do not recognize, asking for food and request of El Shaddai, may God Almighty El Shaddai give you mercy as you go before the man. Bless you with mercy so that he will release Simeon and let Benjamin return. In 48.3, as Joseph visits his dying father, Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty El Shaddai appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And in 49.25, as Jacob is bestowing his final blessing on his children, this particular instance to Joseph, may the God El of your father help you. May the almighty Shaddai bless you with the blessings of the heavens above and blessings of the watery depths below and blessings of the breast and womb. In this name, El Shaddai, the all sufficient one, we learn that only God can bring about what has been promised. Only God can bring to fruition the plans that he has made. And any assumed efforts on our part, not with the invitation from God to help God along, only serve to complicate matters or delay things. Because God is all sufficient. God is all sufficient. When have you experienced the all-sufficiency of God, the shedder forth of blessings, the source of all blessings and fullness and fruitfulness? When have you received those blessings from on high as God, the all-sufficient one, El Shaddai, has poured out his blessings, his love upon you? All-sufficient. But we do get a glimpse of God El Shaddai experienced as the heavy-handed God who corrects or, dis or disciplines and yes, even seemingly destroys. When Naomi arrives in Bethlehem in the first chapter of Ruth after the death of Naomi's husband and two sons, one of whom was Ruth's husband, she says to those who ask, is it really Naomi? Don't call me Naomi. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made my life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? And then in Job, that follows the pitiful life of a man for whom the book is named, Shaddai figures prominently, the title being used some 31 times in its 42 chapters. 
Do not despise the discipline of the Almighty when you sin, for the Almighty has struck me down with arrows. Their poison infects my heart. To this, Stone writes, To experience God's sufficiency, one must also realize one's own insufficiency. Hear that again. To experience God's sufficiency, one must realize one's own insufficiency. To experience God's fullness, one must empty self. It is not easy to empty self. It was never easy to do that. The less empty of self we are, the less of blessing God can pour into us. The more of pride and self-sufficiency, the less fruit we can bear. Sometimes only chastening can make us realize this. Thus it is that name, Almighty God, or El Shaddai, is used in connection with judging, chastening, purging. But always to be emptied in order to be filled and to be filled beyond blessings, beyond measure. Naomi was indeed blessed. She was indeed filled with her daughter-in-law, Ruth, who became her daughter and bore a son who would become the grandfather of David, the ancestor of the promised Messiah. And Job... Job, at the end of the book, we read that Job is, is blessed and receives double what he had lost. Of all that had been taken from him, he received a double portion to be emptied in order to be filled. We have talked about the name El Shaddai as it reflects something of the character of God. But I want to ask, might it also reflect the relationship God desires us to have with him. If El Shaddai refers to the God who is all-sufficient, the God who is all-bountiful, then should that not mean for us that God is enough? Is being in relationship with the one who is all-sufficient sufficient enough for us? And really, does that not mean that God should be more than enough for us? Let's consider Abram and Jacob again. Abram acts upon his relationship, Abraham at this point, acts upon his relationship with God as the all-sufficient one who has fulfilled his promise. But in that troublesome passage of Genesis 22, he is willing to sacrifice that blessing his own son Isaac, at God's command. Was it because he trusted God would provide? Which introduces us to another name, by the way, Jehovah Jireh, God as provider. Or was it because even if he lost his son, God was sufficient enough for him? God was more than enough for him. When Jacob called upon El Shaddai to be merciful upon his sons before Joseph so he would release Simeon and Benjamin to return home, was he trusting in God to do that? Or was he declaring that God was sufficient for him, even if, so be it, they did not return? God in indeed wants to bless us. But the first and greatest blessing we are given is God's self. The first and greatest blessing God gives us is the opportunity for relationship with God's self. St. Augustine wrote in his classic, The Confessions, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Our hearts are restless until it finds its rest in thee. Folks, we spend much of our lives chasing after what we believe will bring us joy, what we think will make our lives complete, what we understand to be sufficient 
only to, to discover, hopefully, that true joy, true sufficiency cannot be experienced outside of relationship with El, El Shaddai, who is sufficient, who is all we need. If like Job, everything was taken from us and all we had left was God, we would have enough. If all we have is God, that is sufficient and everything else is icing on the cake. I shared with you, I believe it was my second Sunday, maybe my third, but I believe my second Sunday, about part of my hesitation for going into the ministry. And that was this, this, this feeling I had in my own heart and mind that there was no way I could, could faithfully serve a church full time as well as also have a family. And I knew that God was calling me to be a pastor, but yet I was hesitant because I wanted so much to be married and to have that family. But I finally came to that point when I knew I had to do what God was calling me to do. I finally came to that point where I could say God was enough. And not only was God enough, but God was more than enough for me. God was more than enough for me. And then years later, as I was serving the George Street Church down here in Jefferson City, I met a gentleman that, that we began talking. He was a member of the church as I shared with you. He was from the town that my brothers had gone to school in, so they had run around in similar circles together. And so we knew some common people from North Alabama, Athens. And I remember hearing, I, I heard the words of God say, spoken to me, you have done everything I have asked you to do, now let me bless you. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, let me bless you. But I wanna share with you something I did that I've never shared with anybody, not even my husband. I always try to have a place in my home as an altar that I can go to for my quiet time, my devotion, just to, to spend time in, in prayer, in contemplative prayer. And so I had that space in my home there, the parsonage there at George Street. And, and I had heard not too long before a, a song by Fernando Ortega, Give Me Jesus. And so every night I began to play that song as a part of my time of prayer. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus. You can have all this world, give me Jesus. I had heard what God had said let me bless you. But I was clinging to that, that knowledge, that understanding, that even if that was not going to happen, God was sufficient. God was sufficient. And so that song reminded me that I needed nothing else in this world but God and God alone. God did bless me with nine wonderful years before he passed away. And even now, God is enough. Friends, I ask you today, can you honestly say in your heart that God is all sufficient? That if you had nothing else in this world, that God would be enough? And not just enough, but would be more than enough? You can have all the things in this world, but I pray that we all pray, give me Jesus. Give me 
Jesus. Let us pray. El Shaddai, all-sufficient one, whose love is so abundant that it pours out in blessings upon your children. Today we come before you acknowledging your all-sufficiency, but also acknowledging our self-sufficiency. Lord, help us to understand that there is nothing else in this world we need but you. And that blessings you give us are icing on the cake. Gifts of love that you shower upon us. May you be enough for us. And not just enough, but more than enough for us. For only then can we know that true joy that fills us and overflows and is contagious to those around us. El Shaddai, all-sufficient, all-bountiful one, we give you praise this day. Amen. We are so happy that you worshiped with us today, and we look forward to worshiping with you again next Sunday. We do have some great news about next Sunday, and that is that our district superintendent has approved our plan for in-person worship. And so next Sunday, September the 27th, we will begin in-person worship in the sanctuary once again. We will email and also post on Facebook and mail those without email 
what will be required for you when you come to in-person worship. I will say up front that it will involve the wearing of masks, also letting us know in advance that you plan to attend so that we can make proper seating arrangements to ensure the distance seating that has to be in place. But we're looking forward to coming back together in worship in our sanctuary and spending that time together. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person in worship for the first time. We will continue with our online worship, so don't worry about that. It will continue at the same time every Sunday because some of you I know have chosen to wait until you feel safer or until there's a vaccine even to come back and worship with us. Again, your decision for your family is the right decision. There is no right or wrong decision in this. We want you to feel comfortable and to feel safe and to know that worship will continue online if you have chosen to stay home and worship. May you have a blessed week this week, and we will see you next week, whether in person or online. God bless.